So this is the first or the third lesson of nanoeconomics and really what I'd like to do is kind of try to take a step back. I, I don't really want to present essentially more uh, lecture content, more situations that just mirror what's happening in a Zoom classroom and I really want to kind of um, try to have more of this driven by either questions that I've been asked in other tutoring sessions or questions that people have asked me uh, based on kind of what they see in the world. Um, but I still believe in order to do that, we're, we're really going to need to hammer home a lot of these definitions and just kind of understand them intuitively. So what I'd like to do is kind of start out with just a quick run through of some of these key terms for this chapter since some of them are going to be pretty intuitive and basic and some of them might need a little bit more understanding of what we're talking about and the way I'm going to do that is side by side here with um, the questions from this happens to be the 2012 AP practice exam for microeconomics. So um, it's a previous practice exam. It wasn't one that was officially used, at least not in 2012. Um, and things might have changed a little bit, but again, the key terms and definitions are not going to change year over year, um, although we're definitely in a at strange times economically speaking and kind of have been so since about 2009 so um, we'll see maybe addendums to those textbooks in the future so to kick things off really what I wanted to do is kind of start with some practice questions because this is what you're gonna see uh, in your class and this might be the first point where you start to feel either a little overwhelmed or start to realize, hey, I'm going to have to figure out exactly when I, what I want to get accomplished um, in order to kind of pass this class or get the... So um, the first couple of question or a couple of uh, key terms are going to go with that first question. The next bundle are in the second question, although not necessarily related to each other. And the third set is more of kind of a way of looking going forward um, and seeing what we'll kind of be expanding into in future sessions. And again, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to focus on presenting information kind of slowly and thoroughly here rather than mirroring the, the pace and speed of your, of your class or your lectures. Um, and my goal is to create some resources that you can come back to, as well as kind of generate more of the discussion that I think is where learning is taking place. So, Just a minute, it looks like I'm having some technical issues on my end. Just kind of trying to get rid of some network connections. <clears throat> okay, so looking at it, I the first thing. Um, I did here as I set up these definitions and with trade-offs it's probably the most simple one uh, you probably have a, an idea of what we're talking about when it comes to trade-offs um, if you're not quite certain how to think about trade-offs in an economic context imagine you're hungry you're at a restaurant with a menu board at two different combo options um, in this scenario, you're not likely to order both combos because they both sound good. Um, so you're going to choose between one or the other. And that's really what we're talking about when it comes to trade-offs. 
Um, so every choice you make has a cost. And in this context, we're talking about the opportunity cost. Um, so there's a few key words that I'm terms and, and vocabulary or ways of describing it that I'm always looking for when it comes to opportunity costs. So So what we typically look at is it's what I get, uh, what I am giving up in order to get something else. And it's also the value of the next best alternative. I'm going to just pause for a moment. I see I'm dropping tons of frames. I don't know that it's going to matter that much, but I want to make sure this will be usable. All right, so I'm back. I'm not sure that I was able to get it fixed, but I don't know that the issue I'm seeing is actually going to cause problems for us.
so the first thing I'll I'll kind of do is is uh, look at that first question in terms of the practical reality of what most people want to accomplish when we're taking a micro or macroeconomics course is to understand it well enough to get the grade that we want out of the class. So um, I personally think there's benefit in you understanding economics at a deeper level and carrying that through um, and in your real world understanding uh, as you get older and carry about carry out your lives. But um, when it comes right down to it, I recognize that most students really, uh, unless you're an economics major, um, you're more likely interested in something else, and this is a stepping stone to getting where you want to be. Um, so I do want to take that understanding into account when I take this approach. Um, and so that's why I think looking at the questions you're likely to see and talking about it and developing an intuitive understanding of the vocabulary is, for me, the best way for you to kind of come away from this economics class, not only with a better understanding of the topic, but also um, where you don't, don't hate economics forever. So, for number one, which of the following best defines opportunity cost? So, as I put in the notes, there's a couple of phrases that I'm looking for when I'm considering what the opportunity cost is. It's what I give up in order to get something else, or it's the value of the next best alternative. Um, and so, in this case, if we read through the choices, um, and just as a side note, a strategy that is really helpful in economics and in other topics as well is when you're practicing for and preparing for an exam and you've got something like a multiple choice sample practice exam, it's, it's more important to understand the choices that you're given and why each of the other choices is incorrect and maybe how you could reword the question to make other choices be the correct answer. That's more valuable than simply like going through the questions and circling what you think the right answer is and then grading it at the end and seeing what your score would be. Because yeah, you can capture what score you're gonna get, um, but if your goal is to study and improve your score, um, really what we wanna do is go through and understand why the other choices aren't correct and maybe be prepared for what that same question would look like outside of a sample setting, but in a, a real exam where you're um, rearranging one word or changing one word of the question and you end up creating an entirely different result. So one of the other choices is now the correct answer. So for A, it's the cost of producing those goods most desired by a given economy. And I don't know that I was trying to kind of think of what definitionally this might fit. Um, it does generally relate to maybe it, we could look at it as total cost of production at equilibrium. Um, but we would probably have more productive ways of describing a scenario that that fits. So A would not only be something that we could kind of not consider to be correct, but there's not really a case where we would accept that answer or that answer would be the most, would make the most sense. Um, for B, it's the cost of the input mix, in other words, the ingredients, that will lead to the greatest rate of growth for a given company. So... 
I guess the the easiest way to pull back from that is when we look at the two, and these aren't definitions, but these two points that I have um, on the right side next to opportunity cost, would I give up and the value of the next best alternative? It's really not exclusively limited to a company. In fact, it there's opportunity costs for all kinds of things, whether they're related to companies, uh, countries, individual decisions, whatever it may be. So when you decide to watch your favorite TV show instead of spending an hour studying, you've your opportunity cost was the improvement in your score um, on the exam you might have been studying for. If you decided to study, then your opportunity cost of studying would be the enjoyment you might have gotten from watching your favorite TV show instead. So again, it's not restricted to a specific company. Um, and so we can kind of automatically ignore that as a correct answer for the definition of opportunity cost. Um, the input mix that will lead to the greatest rate of growth might be something that would be of value to us as, as an economist or as a bit as someone running the the government um, but again that choice b doesn't correlate directly to any specific definition um, that you're going to encounter and the other thing to kind of take in mind, I guess, is that since this is from uh, 2012, there's there's a possibility that some of that vocabulary would be slightly changed. Even if you were presented this exact same question, your incorrect choices might be worded a little differently as well. So for choice C, it's the amount of one product that must be given up in order to produce an additional unit of another product. And this kind of matches up with what I expected, phrasing that I expected to see in a question that talks about what best defines opportunity cost. So uh, let me see if I can, yeah, it's not gonna let me draw on top of it, but, um, what best defines opportunity cost, and that is going to be choice C, what we, the amount of one product that must be given up in order to produce another unit of an additional product. So for example, if um, we are dedicating resources and we've as a as a company we have two designs that are very popular right now um, but we want to maybe we have a higher profit mag, uh, margin on design one on the first design so we want to sell more of those and assuming printing one design versus another design doesn't take any difference in time then the opportunity cost of printing more of the more profitable design is one of the other choice. But maybe we're considering it like uh, design one that's more profitable is a um, kind of wraparound hoodie printed design and uh, design two that's not as profitable is just a t-shirt. So in order to get more of these highly profitable wraparound hoodie designs, it, it uh, is going to involve giving up maybe five plain printed t-shirts. So the opportunity cost in terms of production is how much of one good we're going to give up when we decide to produce another good. Um, another kind of household production context might be... Um, how much other things that you might give up to get done around the house. So like if you have a lot of chores that you want to get done in a given day, then the opportunity cost of cooking every meal that you eat that day from scratch is a lot higher because there are 
a lot of things competing for that same 24 hour period of your day of your time. Um, whereas if you were to decide to order, order food in, then essentially the opportunity cost of, of ordering food is lower on a day when you have other things to be getting accomplished. So opportunity cost can relate to kind of anything. You're, if you're watching this stream right now, you are paying an opportunity cost in terms of whatever you would be, if you imagine whatever you'd be doing instead, um, that is the opportunity cost you pay for studying economics. So for choice D on number one, it says, um, as far as, as a, even though we've isolated and, and identified that C is going to be what we would, would select, um, but we still want to at least talk about and understand why D and E won't be correct. So for D, it is the use of the least cost method of production. So uh, this is maybe the strangest way of wording it. And again, I think that relates to it being from 2012. But the least cost method would be essentially trying to produce things for as cheaply as we possibly can. So if we imagine we're, we're printing t-shirts, um, then the least cost mes method might involve trying to find the cheapest um, paint to use and the cheapest t-shirts to use and doing it all ourselves so that where we, we don't pay any overhead cost or labor. Um, but it doesn't really relate to opportunity cost. And, and in terms of, of economics, it's not really going to come into play just yet. Um, it really won't relate to things until we t start talking about the long run and what the long run does for us when there's competition. And for E, the fifth choice on number one, it is the cost of labor used in the production process. So um, the strangest thing for Choice E is that choice E actually is is just I mean the cost of labor used in the production process would just simply be called the cost the labor costs um, and labor costs since you only have to pay your workers when your workers come in and make stuff for you that labor cost is a cost that we would call variable. So it varies with the amount of t-shirts that we print that month, for example. But again, it's not related to either what we're giving up to get something else or the value of what we would be doing instead, kind of comparing what we do with this time and money and resources to what we would be doing instead of this specific activity. See, I think I can actually save it and highlight these. No, it's still not going to let me. That's fine. Um, so that's number one, and you're you're pretty much any kind of exam setting. If this was in the the chapters. Uh, or if it's a comprehensive final exam, you're going to come across something that tests whether or not you have a working understanding of opportunity costs. Um, and so, again, it relates back to what I said in the first and second lessons, where if you really want to succeed um, at this level of economics, or if you want to make it work for you as you pursue your business degree, the key is in developing an intuitive understanding of what that vocabulary is, is meaning, what those key terms indicate. And so for the opportunity cost, I, I typically create that vision of Netflix or studying. And that's kind of my, my standard opportunity cost 
um, imagination. Or alternatively, I might imagine myself at a restaurant looking at a menu board and trying to decide between what I see in two pictures for entree items or options. All right, and on number two, we're going to move on here. I've put a couple of definitions here, and the one thing to kind of point out before we get too far along is I just want to note that um, these definitions don't necessarily relate to the answer or the correct interpretation of this question. So, for example, the law of supply and the law of demand um, aren't actually going to be um, their, their choices, but we're, we're just going to define them so that we can understand why they're not the correct choice. So number two, which of the following explains why a production possibilities curve is often represented as concave? or bowed out from the origin. In other words, what we typically see with a production possibilities curve is this bowed out image. And I'm going to go ahead and grab this one just because it's a good representation. Um, and the, the reasoning behind that is because there's a difference between good X and good Y. So that would be why we have a bowed out shape to our production possibilities curve. I saw one here, um, and this is a good example of, of maybe a, the way a question might be presented to you as well. Um, which asking you which of these two production possibilities curves represents kind of what we would expect. Um, and so the first thing we want to kind of do is define production possibilities curve. So essentially, it's the options of what we could be producing given the resources that we have. So given all the uh, equipment and workers and all their expertise and all of their uh, all of the um, inputs, uh, such as components and parts that we have available, we are an economy that produces either computers or cars. So that's the, the scenario we're being presented here. And so scenario one with computers or cars, let me do this. Scenario one with computers or cars. is kind of basically looking at it just give myself a little bit of space here So if we're considering we're either making computers or cars, scenario one on the left represents if all of the same ingredients and components and elements. So if you imagine a factory that's set up to build computers, the, the um, skill set that's required that's in use there at a factory building computers is different 
in terms of the expertise and in terms of cars we're also talking about different components so like we need a lot more like heavy steel we need steel workers we need body work there's also some electronics but we also don't necessarily need high-end processing power um, and in this case we're kind of ignoring the fact that all those component parts might be produced in different places but if we just imagine this hypothetical economy is producing either computers or cars then this would be a trade-off where they are there's a one-for-one -one ratio between cars and computers In other words, the same exact inputs and the same skills required. And so for the second one, that's really what we see in a standard real world scenario. And it relates back to question number two as written. Uh, which of the following explains why a production possibilities curve is often represented as a concave or bowed out from the origin? So why that would be is because of the opportunity cost or the trade-off between producing those two goods. And so that different trade-off is that as we, as we convert our economy away from producing cars and start to try to produce more and more computers, what we end up with is a scenario where some of our, our steel workers now need to be trained on um, kind of computer programming or something like that. So the cost of getting the last car production capability converted from cars to computers is a lot higher than maybe um, taking the excess auto workers and creating the computer industry to begin with so as we pro as we produce more of something So that is called increasing opportunity cost. And that is the kind of key vocabulary that we're really looking at here. So for number two, For number two, I kind of wanted to arrive at the correct answer of E, increasing opportunity costs, and then talk a little bit about what the other ones are going to imply and what they're going to mean. So decreasing opportunity costs would almost mean that that, that curve is bowed in. In other words, if you want to stop making 
cars, then you actually get even more production of computers as you increase it. And that it what it that defies as kind of the the understanding of the real world and scarce resources um, because part of the the fact that opportunity costs are going to increase at some point is that we do have scarce resources and one of those scarce resources is time so if we if we really really love pizza we still wouldn't have we wouldn't be making a wise decision to spend 24 hours of every single day making pizza eating pizza learning new pizza recipes so that's what when it comes to increasing opportunity cost as you do more of that activity the cost of what you the value of something else is increasing so when you um, you know, work eight hours in a, in a day, and then you're working a couple of hours of overtime. As you increase hours of overtime, the value you might feel for going back and spending time with your friends and family instead is going up and up. So that once you've already worked 12 hours in a day, um, you might, if, if you're in that position, you might tell your boss, you'd need to pay me a lot more to stay any longer. Um, the, the real world of the labor market doesn't necessarily dictate you could tell your boss that, um, but in theory, you would feel like you need more money or more um, compensation of some kind because the uh, value of the next best alternative um, to working when you've already worked 14 hours straight is very, very high because eventually you're the next best alternative is going to be sleep and you're going to value sleep over any other thing. Even if your boss says to you, I'll pay you, um, you know, $200 an hour to stay another hour. Um, you might still want to do it, but your value of sleep is very, very high. So that's why decreasing opportunity cost isn't something that we would really ever expect to see. But what, what it kind of relates to is decreasing marginal utility that we talked about in the first lesson as some of that visualizable, intuitive, key terminology and vocabulary. Um, diminishing marginal utility or the de decreasing additional value you get out of something has to do with the fact that there is an increasing opportunity cost to doing it. So the additional value of swimming for the third hour in a row um, is much higher because you have already been in the water for a long time. Maybe you're waterlogged. Maybe your skin is all, all pruny and wrinkled and you just want to get out and just kind of relax for a while. Um, so that is as you do more and more of the activity, even if it's your favorite thing in the whole world, there is an opportunity cost that is increasing as a result. Um, so moving kind of backwards from bottom to top, uh, we've got choice C and it says constant returns to scale. And I don't want to get too far ahead of where we're actually at currently with vocabulary. What I would say with constant returns to scale is that's another example of, of multi-word key terms. So constant returns to scale kind of needs to all be taken together as one bold term in your textbook. And the constant returns to scale essentially implies that as you make more of something, there is no change in your opportunity cost. If your opportunity cost is increasing as you make more of something, then we would say you are in what the vocabulary would be called diseconomies of scale. And if you have decreasing opportunity costs in that kind of initial stage, it's kind of typically as you just got started with something maybe, um, and so increasing your capacity to bake cupcakes to sell 
is pretty easy to do when you're going from like your home baker's dozens or your home dozen racks to um, like a, a rented commercial kitchen. So constant returns to scale means there's no change in opportunity cost. Decreasing opportunity cost implies economies of scale and increasing opportunity cost implies diseconomies of scale. So that vocabulary all goes together and we are going to work more specifically with the vocabulary. We're going to write those terms down and visualize them graphically. Um, at this point, we're not going to do that because what we really, really want to do is just talk about what these choices mean, what they would be related to, and kind of build up our understanding of these key terms. So um, that'll be in a later lesson, and I will clip out and make a highlight video for that specific topic as well. Um, moving along to choices B and A, the law of supply and the law of demand. Um, and really, these are these can be understood more intuitively. If something that you like to buy is on sale, you're likely to increase the quantity of that item that you demand in most cases. So there are some things that you're not necessarily going to buy more of just because it's on sale, but you might rush to the store to buy it quickly. Um, or you might be happier to put add-ons onto the, the thing that's on sale. Um, so the law of demand essentially states that as the price of a good rises, the quantity demanded decreases. Um, and as the price of the good decreases, the quantity demanded of that good decreases. So what we what we really can get to is the intuition of our demand curve. Whoops. What what the law of demand tells us is why the demand curve slopes downward. So if you, and actually what we're going to do is I'm going to, we're definitely going to cover demand and supply thoroughly and in depth. I'd rather um, talk about more examples, give you more different ways to hear it. Because one thing I've found with a lot of these topics is there can be an easy moment where it clicks and you say, aha, and everything starts to make much more sense from then on. Um, but if I, I feel like if every time we've got more we can talk about, I, I go down that tangent, I think what we're going to do is run into the same problem you're going to have in a classroom setting and why I've, I've had uh, sufficient demand for tutoring for, for five years now. So... Um, I think, and this is a learning experience for me too, because typically in a tutoring session, I can spend my entire time responding directly to questions from someone else. So here, I'm kind of hearkening back to my days creating lesson plans and teaching a full lesson, and it's, uh, it's I'm a little bit rusty in that setting. 
I'm also really, really trying to focus on creating something that provides value and is a little bit different than what else you might find out there. There are a lot of great resources and I'm not just trying to be kind of a copy or a clone of, of them, um, but I want to kind of catch the, uh, the marginal, um, the marginal stragglers and those who fall between the cracks in those scenarios. So all that is to say, we're going to cover law of demand even more um, in detail, but the best way to understand it is it tells us why there's a downward slope to the demand curve. Um, and it relates to how you make decisions. If the price is low, you're going to put more in your cart. If the price is high, you're going to put less in your cart. So the example that I always visualize when I think of the law of demand is the pasta aisle in the grocery store. Um, if I am looking at pasta and I have all the other ingredients and I'm thinking about making spaghetti this week um, and the, the pack of spaghetti noodles is not on sale, so it's $2 for a package of uh, spaghetti noodles. I might say, all right, well, I've got everything else. I already plan to make spaghetti. I'm going to buy one package of spaghetti noodles. Now, if I imagine as I'm standing in front of the pasta, the worker comes by and says, oh, we've got a price change here. And they drop the price from $2 a package to 50 cents a package. I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, that's actually going to change the way that I feel about putting spaghetti packages in my par, uh, in my cart. And so I decide to go from one package at $2 to, I might even put, honestly, I might put uh, 20, 20 packages of, of spaghetti or, you know, especially if it affects, if the price is for, um, 50 cents for the macaroni and, and the rotini and all that, then that's when I, I'm going to look at that 50 cent per pack price and I'm going to stock up on pretty non-perishable pastas. Um, and so that is the law of demand in action. The price of the good decreases. The quantity that I demand increased. So one of the things we really, really want to separate, and we're going to do it over time again, is demand if i say demand that means something maybe slightly different than if i say quantity demanded or if i say supply versus quantity supplied so i really really want to kind of emphasize there's a difference and for this lesson i'm actually not going to get into specifically what that means and why because i think we're foreshadowing and highlighting some things that we're going to cover in the future, but I want to make an entire lesson about demand, how we understand it, all the surrounding vocabulary about demand. Uh, we're going to touch on a topic called determinants of demand. Uh, but for right now, we're looking at the law of demand. We're thinking about pasta. The price goes down while I'm standing in front of it in the grocery store. So the quantity... I put in my cart increases and that's why the demand curve slopes downward and the inverse is true with the law of supply as the price of the good rises the quantity supplied increases and vice versa and this tells us why the supply curve slopes up And let me put my
So with the law of supply, the example I usually use is concert tickets. There's a little bit of uniqueness in terms of concert tickets, but it's not necessarily going to create any issues with the example that we're working with here. Um, specifically in that, like a, a concert venue um, might not have, you know, they, they wouldn't have a, a slope to the supply curve because there's a certain amount of tickets available and they can't sell more by order of the fire marshal. Um, but when we think of us as suppliers, concert tickets is a great example because if you hold a ticket to a concert and you can either go to the concert or not go to the concert and you aren't a thousand percent dedicated to going to that concert, you might look at this scenario and say, What's, what are people offering um, to pay for these tickets? So say you paid $100 and the current going price for those tickets is a thousand dollars your your willingness to supply is going to be increased um, so as the price of the good as the price of the tickets that um, people are offering you increases the likelihood you are to increase your quantity supplied is also going to increase or another way of looking at it is as you can start selling your um, limited edition t-shirts for more uh, money or a higher profit margin, the more likely you are to decide to um, kind of take on that business endeavor and go ahead and supply that item. And that is increasing the quantity that's available to people. In other words, it tells us why the supply curve slopes upward. More um, people will get in line to sell their item if the going price that they can sell it for is going up and up and up. So their kind of uh, demand are going to be really common questions that you're asked. With question number two, it says, which of the following explains why a production possibilities curve is often represented as a concave uh, or bowed out from the origin curve? And that is because of increasing opportunity costs. We talked about some of the other vocabulary to try to understand it, but... Um, The, the answer to number two really in the law of supply or law of demand is the fact that there's an increasing opportunity cost that we must pay over time. And the last thing that I wanted to do today was do like a little bit of foreshadowing for what um, we'll get into as we kind of move into the, the demand specific lesson and that is to talk about substitutes as economic vocabulary um, in a context so the best way to look at this or the best way to understand this kind of relates to something that I said in the previous lesson which is that vocabulary is not only critical to understanding economics, but I, I'm a firm believer that any new topic that you want to under get into and learn about, you should really immerse yourself in the vocabulary and understand the vocabulary at that same kind of second grader level where you've got definitions and you know maybe you're not going through the exercise of writing it down and highlighting it and studying it but you're trying to memorize it in the exact same way so that that real world quiz setting is is something that you can easily pass um, and so when i was substitute teaching one of the examples that i would use are i would write down um, gate, envelope, attack, and release on the whiteboard. And I would ask students to just help me define those words. 
And I would also ask students if they knew why I wrote those four words together. Why, if, if there's anything they could see as a, a common thread there. Um, and so if anyone is familiar with audio, um, the, the gate envelope attack and release is going to relate to the kind of vocabulary of a compressor that is going to take the audio that's coming in and essentially bring up the volume of quieter noises that you want to be audible and also gate out and kind of close off the noises that you don't want to have present. So um, on my microphone right now, I don't remember if I've got the compressor turned on, um, but what the compressor would be doing is making sure you hear my voice, um, but don't hear the voice of the air conditioner hum when that turns on. Um, and so all of that is to say that vocabulary is critical in learning anything. And so a lot of times kind of going through that vocabulary um, was a good spark for some students in a high school level where, uh, you know, you could, you could learn four key terms that they might have actually learned if they chose to go to school to be music producers. Um, and so envelope especially was a great example where, or like gate, um, you can think of eight different contexts where there's a gate and the usage of, of gating. Um, and in a in general sense, they're all wrapped around the same idea that a gate prevents something from moving um, from one side of it to another unless the gate is open. Um, but understanding that vocabulary in the context is the critical element of it. So you might think you understand what the word trade-offs means, but unless you relate trade-offs to the opportunity cost concept, then you might be missing some elements, some key elements when you're studying economics. And that brings us back to the foreshadowing and, and highlighting uh, future lesson from number three on this uh, section one practice um, is assume that consumers consider popcorn and pretzels to be substitutes. A significant decrease in the supply of popcorn will affect the pretzel market by um, any number of these choices. And again, we're not going to go through this. We just want to pull out and notice that um, substitutes is a word that has definition in different contexts. So a substitute when you walk into a classroom means something different than a substitute when you are preparing a recipe in a home economics class or a substitute in terms of um, what might be happening on the, the baseball field. So um, that's where what we really want to do is remember that even something so basic as substitutes still deserves our economic definition before we kind of move along um, And we're I'm, we're gonna go ahead and do that in the next lesson. I don't want to don't want to make these too long, and I also have to kind of work inside a, a window of quiet time. Um, so today, really, what I wanted to do and what we discussed is trade offs and opportunity cost from the working backwards from a multiple choice question that you're likely to see and talking more about the real world that you'd see outside of the classroom where you're going to get that multiple choice question. Um, second, we looked at the production possibilities curve and how it really is relating to the ingredients that we use and the skills that we put into making something and how it's going to be different between cars or computers or, um, you know, common examples are like pizza and pasta. 
Um, a lot of the ingredients are, are going to overlap, but maybe it's a different ratio. Maybe the cooking process is a little bit different. Um, so again, unless the, the in, inputs, the ingredients are completely identical, that curve is going to be bowed out um, in, in most scenarios. It's usually kind of a of an oversimplified case where we create a situation where that straight line scenario on the left graph is the accurate one. Um, then we looked at the law of demand and law of supply, uh, and we made sure to point out that there's a big difference between vocabulary of demand versus quantity demanded and supply versus quantity supplied. Those are four key terms as opposed to different ways to phrase the same vocabulary. And finally, we kind of foreshadowed what's going to come out in the future, which is a um, more in-depth lesson on demand and the law of demand, as well as um, kind of good focus on the ways that some of this vocabulary might have corollary in everyday life, but we need to really bring it back home and focus on the economic understanding of these key terms in order to do, do well in, in this class. So um, thank you for anyone who's, who's listening, um, listening after the fact in the, in the clips that will be, that we'll be uploading. And um, if you have questions, I've got the suggestion box on my Twitch page. Always feel free to send messages to nanoeconomicstv at gmail.com. Really anything you message me that you would like to have covered, I will cover that. So I also do work individually with students and I understand how you know some people might just prefer that to cut it out um, and only be the the one on the other end. Um, but if you're kind of like me and and wouldn't necessarily be in a situation to to pay someone for their full attention um, and their expertise, then that's a big part of what I wanted to do here with this lesson is make this information available to anyone who just wants to get get to it um, and find the, the, the resources that will help them the most. So again, thank you. And this is uh, has been episode three of Nanoeconomics, Exploring Opportunity Cost and Production Possibilities.